In recent weeks, the attack on lockdown sceptics online has become more vigorous, with sceptics being attacked for being cranks, spreading misinformation and being full-on dangerous in their influence. A new website on behalf of lockdown advocates, I suppose you'd call them, has been promoted by some of the mainstream media as the effective counter-attack to the sceptics. So what is the state of debate between the two? The stakes with the pandemic and the effects of lockdown have never been higher, so let's take a look. Throughout the pandemic, there has been a lively debate around the action of the governments to implement lockdowns. The measure was first taken by China, of course, but then, you know, they're an authoritarian communist government, so of course it was. The UK government, and most other governments, assumed that you couldn't, and you really probably shouldn't, do that sort of thing if you're a democracy. But then Italy was the next to get hit, and it got hit hard. And it implemented a lockdown, and suddenly everyone else realised, maybe you could. Even if in years to come, you look back on all the pros and cons as they played out during and after the event, even if you did that, and concluded that it was the right policy, there is no way that such an extreme policy should not be vigorously debated and subjected to scrutiny. That's the strength of democracy, after all. You can challenge what the government does. If their policies are good, they can be defended. If some of the critics have a point, then you can amend or change those policies and make them better. Most of the challenges, though, have come from people simply arguing that the government should have locked down harder and faster. And now some of those people have become much more aggressive in going after the lockdown sceptics. So a new website has been set up, Antivirus for COVID-19 FAQ. The site aims to tackle all of the main lockdown sceptic arguments and in addition goes after some of the high-profile sceptics personally highlighting, it says, how often they've been wrong over the previous months. Amongst the founders and promoters of the new site are a Member of Parliament from the governing party, Neil O'Brien. And the site has had significant mainstream media coverage, to the effect that, at last, someone's sticking it to these dangerous oddballs and their arguments. On this channel, I've not been a campaigner for either side on this. I've looked with interest at the various debates that have raged. I found some of the sceptic arguments, such as those highlighting certain limitations of the PCR tests, as having a good foundation. Other arguments have been a little too ready to draw conclusions from what happened in other countries. Which, you know, is a bad habit that people on both sides share. They just choose different countries to make their points. If you're saying lockdown is bad, you compare to Sweden. If you're saying lockdown is good, you compare to New Zealand. And of course, whenever anyone predicts the future, they need to be standing on very solid ground, and that's not always been the case. But let's look at some of the key arguments, as they've been highlighted by this new website, and see what we can make of them. It falls into three sections, effects of COVID-19, lockdown scepticism and COVID-19 prevention and treatment. Then there's a section where they take pot shots at individuals who have been high profile in lockdown sceptical arguments. I can't in one video do a detailed dive on all of the arguments, but I'll pick some of the most common ones that I've seen. There's a link to the site in the video description so you can look at their full content. Claim. 99.5% of people survive COVID, hence we're overreacting. At the head of that page, there's an apparent quote. The infection fatality rate, IFR, of COVID-19 is very low. 99.5% of people survive it. The entire world is drastically overreacting to what doesn't kill the vast majority. Although it's in speech marks, it's not attributed to a specific individual. Google the phrase in its entirety, and it doesn't seem to be a direct quote. But there are enough different examples of this around not to get head up on that and conclude it's some sort of straw man argument. And here it is a fairly straightforward rebuttal based on the math of small percentages of large numbers. 0.5% people dying sounds like a tiny amount, but if the virus is highly infectious, and surely that much isn't in dispute, then that can turn into large numbers of people who die. 
In the UK, the virus passed unimpeded to the bulk of the population, the number would be up to 300,000. Now, you might argue there are factors that mean the virus wouldn't do that. It would decline before it infected the 80% of people that would deliver that exact figure. That's a different claim to the one that's being made here, though. Arguments based purely on the argument that 0.5% is too small to matter are ignoring how big a number small percentages actually entail. There are other arguments in there about whether 99.5% is even the right number anyway, but I would say the core argument's enough. Score one for the advocates. I don't see a lot of sceptics arguing that case anymore, and maybe that's why. So let's move on to the next one. Claim. 91% of COVID cases are false positives. This is a case-demic. This is the argument that Ivor Cummins, amongst others, was making during the summer. And it's certainly one that I reported sympathetically then, because facts and maths behind the argument was sound. But it was an argument being made during the summer, when the case numbers had risen sharply, but mostly in line with massively increased testing. And that rise in case numbers wasn't being reflected in any increase in deaths long after the time lag that we saw in the first wave meant that it should have been. And the response on this point acknowledges the validity of the argument in principle. And it says this, The false positive logic is valid, but it is irrelevant. It's true to say that with low infection numbers in the community and even a high-seeming test specificity, e.g. 99%, we'd get a lot of cases that are really false positives. They then go on to make two arguments. One, the virus rates aren't low, so the maths doesn't work. If there are large numbers of actual cases, then the false positives are a tiny percentage of those and statistically irrelevant. And two, we have good reason to think that the specificity of the test is higher than 99%. So the percentage of false positives would therefore be even lower. Now, the first of those I find to be disingenuous, because as far as I can recollect, that argument was only being made during the summer, when the case numbers were shown as increasing, as rates of testing were increasing, and deaths didn't move at all. I haven't seen anyone suggesting that the current wave, with all the pressure we're seeing in hospital ICUs and with deaths going up, that we're still in a so-called case-demic. They may be making other arguments, but not that one. This is one of the arguments that they highlight in their attack on individuals, for instance, and they show quotes talking about the falseness of the claimed second wave running from May. Yes, they were talking about the second wave almost as soon as the first one had ended, if you remember, through to September. Does the fact that a second wave actually did come when the seasons changed invalidate criticisms of extreme lockdown policies based on potential false readings during the summer? Well, I don't see how. Well, what about the test specificity point? Since that seems more solid, because if that one's correct, then that would rule out the possibility that those summer figures were a case-demic at all. I mean, it would then be a mystery why the deaths didn't follow when you would have expected them to. But mysteries do come along time to time. The obvious and intuitive answers aren't always the correct ones. They provide a link to a recent research paper that supports their contention. Research that was carried out in Wuhan, China, that recognised that from one million tests carried out, only 300 cases were detected. Now, even if all of those were false positives, that implies that the error was massively less than 1%. That's relevant and influential, but not conclusive. I would argue for two reasons. One political, one practical. The political one is that China is not a neutral place to be carrying out a study on a topic where the government cares about the outcome. The study says this. Findings from this study show that COVID-19 was well controlled in Wuhan at the time of the screening programme. OK, that's very much what the government wants to hear, isn't it? It has actively propagandised on how well it handled things. I don't think that's disputed by anyone. That doesn't mean that the research was definitely compromised. But it does mean one might validly seek to double check to see if there are other sources with confirmation. The practical one comes down to how the tests were done. If a government was sensitive about the results, 
then they certainly had an incentive to ensure as small a number of false results as possible. They said this, multiple measures were taken to possibly minimise false negative results in the screening programme. For example, Standard training was provided to health workers for sample collection to ensure the sample quality. For the real-time RT-PCR assay, two target genes were simultaneously tested. Even so, false negative results remain possible, particularly in any mass screening programmes. So, when I researched my video on the PCR tests, I recall that a significant number of false positives come from contamination introduced during handling. So they took a great deal of care to avoid that happening in this study. And they tested for two, not just one, target gene. They were doing their utmost not to get false results. The question then is, how representative of real-world testing practice is what was done in Wuhan as reported in that study? This was not, after all, a study designed to identify the false positive rate. It was a study to show how much genuine COVID there was or was not in that community at that time. I did a quick search on Google Scholar to see what papers there might be that specifically looked at the issue of potential false positives. First up was this one. Diagnosing COVID-19 infection, the danger of over-reliance on positive test results. Now, it's a preprint meaning it hasn't yet been peer-reviewed, which is the case for a lot of the COVID research right now. So bear that in mind. Here's the first part of the abstract. Contrary to the practice during previous epidemics, with COVID-19, health authorities have treated a single positive result from a PCR-based test as confirmation of infection, irrespective of signs, symptoms and exposure. This is based on a widespread belief that positive results in these tests are highly reliable. However, evidence from external quality assessments and real-world data indicate a high enough false positive rate to make positive results highly unreliable over a broad range of scenarios. Then from the body of the study, the only published data on the full false positive rate of SARS-CoV-2 tests in real-world settings appear to be from two studies that found rates of 0.3% and 3% in pre-surgical patients. Adding another study that assessed 52 Austrian laboratories, they came up with a range from 0.4% to 6.3%. So look, I don't want to spend any more time on this because in many ways it's a moot point. It's clearly not a case-demic now. Maybe it was in the summer. But I'm not encouraged that in responding to this case, they miss out the historical context at the time the claim was made. And then they quote a scientific paper that wasn't designed to show what they said and ignored the ones that were, which didn't agree with their position. That's cherry picking. And exactly why you always have to check when you get people that are bunkered into a specific position quoting the science to support their position. The only element where they get any kind of hit on this one comes from the times when Toby Young or Ivor Cummins allowed themselves to get pulled into predicting there would never be a second wave. Predicting something definitely will or won't happen is a mugs game, it seems to me. So Toby Young did that and he was pulled up on it on the BBC Newsnight programme and he just shrugged and said, I hold my hand up to that, I got that wrong. Which, you know... It's fair response. A lot of people behaved as though he'd just owned up to beating small children or something. But predicting the future was such a small part of the lockdown sceptic's case, it wasn't that surprising that he wouldn't think it was that killer an admission to make. So anyway, I think their section on this topic is misleading. That's one all between the advocates and the sceptics. Of course, the real heart of the sceptics case is that the negative impact of lockdown is significantly greater than the benefit. Here's the quote that the advocates give on this to refute. By shutting down the NHS, driving people to suicide and creating poverty and unemployment that worsens people's long-term health, lockdowns themselves carry enormous mortality costs that make them more costly than mere economic analysis can measure. As a result, lockdowns lead to many deaths, perhaps more than they prevent. I think, as written, that's unarguably true because it's highly qualified. Perhaps more than they prevent. It doesn't profess certainty. Which is, 
you know, it's kind of a point with this discussion. We have a rolling death count of COVID mortality. The negative costs of lockdowns will only be felt over a longer time frame. And nobody's apparently keeping score. There is no rolling count of those other impacts. Anyway, what do the advocates say about this argument? One, there is absolutely no evidence that lockdowns cause remotely as many deaths as COVID-19 has, they say. All claims that lockdowns kill at all are based on speculation that is at odds with the empirical evidence. COVID-19 has killed 90,000 people in the UK and counting as of 19th January 2021. Risen to 100,000 since then, sadly. And the number of excess deaths since the start of a pandemic closely tracks the number of deaths associated with COVID. While lockdown does have significant costs, many of those costs would be worse without lockdown because COVID would be spreading uncontrolled across the country, crippling the health service and the economy. The first point is premature. The sceptics aren't arguing that lockdowns have already caused lots of deaths. Rather that as all the missed cancer referrals and other serious ailments come home to roost, those numbers will be seen in the future. The second point is more logically solid ground, however. The degradation and closure of NHS services has been because of COVID, not lockdowns. Lockdowns involve restrictions on shopping, eating out, travel and business, but not health care where NHS trusts have tragically had to stop treating people for conditions like cancer and heart disease and paused elective surgeries, it's been because COVID cases have been so high that they've had to divert resources like beds and medical staff to treating those patients and because the risk of those patients catching COVID in hospitals was too high. This gets to the heart of why this is such a difficult debate because they're absolutely right on that point. Many of the negative non-coronavirus impacts would come regardless of lockdowns because the impacts come from behaviour change as well as, as they say, the heightened load on hospitals. Now, all this is very timely because the government has just released some estimates relating to this question. It believes that more than 100,000 people are likely to die from non-coronavirus causes because of a pandemic. By the end of next month, the chaos in hospitals and care homes will have led to 46,000 avoidable deaths, according to the Department of Health Research. Cancellations to routine operations may cause 18,000 excess deaths in the long term, on top of hundreds more from cancer. Over the next few years, they estimate that 40,000 may die in the aftermath of the economic impact of lockdown, including rising unemployment and mental health issues. The government believes the overall death toll will be around 222,000, with just over half of that number, 54%, dying from the virus itself. Let's just take a moment before jumping all over that with a view to what who thinks it proves what. To note, that's a pretty horrible outcome for all those people and their families. You know, let's not get so caught in the debate to lose sight of what those numbers actually represent. Now, the government tempers that figure by saying that the figure for COVID deaths would be twice as bad without lockdown. And the sceptics say that's a fairly difficult argument to make. There was the paper I quoted in the Do Lockdowns Work video that showed that the behaviour change that comes with a pandemic achieves the vast majority of the spread reduction. That study is supported by the fact that Sweden's deaths per million were around the EU average, in spite of not imposing lockdowns. So to argue if we did what they did and not what we did, our deaths would be twice as bad, it's not clear that can be the case. We have one of the worst deaths per million rates in the world. If a change in policy could lead to such a huge increase, you would expect that such a number would have been seen for some country somewhere in the world. But the basic point works both ways. Many of the additional non-COVID deaths would have come regardless of whether lockdowns were enforced or not. Now, both sides dig themselves deeply into the trenches on this one and present somewhat black and white pictures of what's going on. The truth is really a lot more nuanced. There is no silver bullet solution that says, if only we did X, nobody would die. As part of the same point, the advocates also then go on to try to show that lockdowns, the lockdown part, is the actual important part of saving lives. 
They do it by referencing the same May 2020 paper that I discussed in the Do Lockdowns Work video, the one that's been highly criticised for programming into a computer model that lockdowns work and then finding by running the model that lockdowns work. That is a simplistic summary, but I discuss it in more detail in the video. And they then acknowledge that there have been those criticisms of that paper. But they then say it's also been confirmed by other studies like this one. And they link to Imperial College's paper that is, again, based on its model. What you get out of these models depends on the assumptions that you feed in. They can't prove something like this. You have to get some real world data. Now, they don't mention or discuss the final paper that I talked about in that video that took evidence from actual real world data. So, again, I have to call cherry picking on that one. Overall, though, I think that section comes out with a score draw on the topic itself, but a big demerit for the COVID FAQ site because of cherry picking papers. And here's the point. I think the debate dynamic created by this website is absolutely what's at the heart of the problem in our current discourse. Not because they're wrong and the other side are right, but because these things split into two sides who then have to defend their staked out territory. Both sides have done this to a large degree, but the nature of this site really makes it plain. We should be curious and debating with urgency and with good faith to work out what are the best policies to see us through an incredibly difficult time. I've seen this happen to a degree with some of the people like Ivor Cummings, for instance. Some very well presented and evidence arguments in the earlier mid stages, raising good questions, challenging orthodoxies. And then the worst thing happened. He became famous for being the skeptic. And the trouble with that is, I mean, it gets you a brilliant audience, but the logic of a position then pushes you further and further into one side rather than positioning you as being curious for the truth wherever it might lead. The lockdown sceptics who were most uncompromising in downplaying any possibility of a second wave, not just that there wasn't one in the summer, which the figures support, but there never ever would be. And then were still bunkered in in refusing to recognise that circumstances had moved on as it all started to unfold. So coming up with more and more problematic excuses and explanations, that's the danger when you have an audience for loyalty of which pushes you into prominence around an argument or a position. To be fair to Toby Young, the Lockdown Skeptics website that he runs has been a much more open repository for sceptical thinking. It's generally been clear-sighted when evidence came in but didn't support a previous position. It's been on a side, but there's been some intellectual commitment of facts, which I think his opponents give him no credit for. It has been a valuable resource for collecting good quality critical analysis. And I would say had scored more hits than misses as a result. That's an impression. It's not something I've quantified. This opposition site doesn't come close to that. It takes arguments that were made within a context and presents them outside of that context. It provides links to supporting evidence that's cherry-picked, which doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it means you can't trust it as a source of the latest or most important science. Again, because it's trying too hard to prove a point. Basically, by going after individuals, it seems much more motivated by the desire to damage them as it is to further the argument. That's the impression given. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know why they set the site up, but it's in line with Neil O'Brien MP's statements pub publicly, where he said the following. The truth is, the Covid sceptics aren't really sceptics at all. They engage in motivated reasoning, make stuff up and double down on claims that have been disproved. They're powerful figures in the media, not used to being questioned. But the truth is, they have a hell of a lot to answer for. Elsewhere, those figures had been described as dangerous and blamed without a huge amount of evidence, as far as I can see, for the UK government's slowness in implementing lockdowns. For me, the idea that you should line up enthusiastically behind a policy that has so many negatives is just bizarre. The question should always be, is there a better approach? It should always be, could we get the benefit without so much cost? If the evidence arises that says an alternative approach might be better, it should be tested hopefully and vigorously. 
To create an orthodoxy over lockdowns and then demonise those who question it is the dumbest, most polarising approach you could possibly take. The advocates risk creating an environment where no debate or dissent is permitted because it's considered dangerous. Whether their arguments are correct or not, the attempt to make them out as dangerous and badly intentioned is the least helpful thing we could be doing. 